Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is the fifth annual Location Managers Guild International panel for Hollywood Location Scouts. So we are the people who work with the director and the production designer to figure out how the story can be created here in the real world. Before we get too far into that though, let's start things off with a quick sizzle reel that shows clips of movies we've worked on lined up with scout photographs that we took uh, prior to the filming. Next, I'd like to acknowledge the companies that sponsored our guild's participation here at Comic-Con. All of these are vendors that we location managers use every week during a film shoot. So it gives you a little bit of a glimpse into some of the things that we handle. Encore Air provides heating and air conditioning on film sets so that the cast and crew are comfortable in extreme environments. Pacific Production Services takes care of filming permits city services, road closures, and on-set police officers. Park as Directed is a cartography company that makes maps with crew parking and film set layouts. Real Security provides security guard protection for the crew and film equipment, and they also provide celebrity bodyguards. And finally, White's Location Equip Equipment Supply is a Toronto-based rental company of catering tents, porta-potties, safety gear, and more. Uh, we'll go around and do some quick introductions. My name is Scott Trimble, and I'm from Northern California originally. I went to UC Berkeley, and I studied archaeology, and I also minored in dramatic arts and mythology. Uh, while in college, I worked as a background extra, and I interned at the Oakland Film Commission, and that led to working my way up in location scouting. Uh, much of my career has been comprised of sequels, such as Iron Man 2, Captain America 2, Mission Impossible 3, 4, and 5, Jurassic Park 4, Transformers 5, Terminator 5, Rocky 6, Planet of the Apes 9, Star Trek 11, and Star Trek 12. <laughs> this panel's only an hour, Scott, so. Um, I've also done a lot of remakes. <laughs> the Mummy, A Wrinkle in Time, A Star is Born, Rollerball, Bedazzled, and Sweet November. 
And then just this past year, the most recent projects that I've been a part of, I scouted for The Circle in Cloverfield 3, and right now I'm working on Breaking In and Venom. My name is Kakai Ampa. I, um, this is my 50th year in the film and television business. Started in 19... Um, started at, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, all right. Uh, started at, K, at the educational station there in 1968 when I got out of high school. Uh, was mentored by uh, Gordon Parks, who was from St. Paul. Uh, he allowed me to uh, come to various sets and learn the business. Uh, moved out here in 77. Before that, I came to uh, L.A. Every, on the 75 and 76, just in the winter, of course, to uh, work on AFI projects. Uh, and then in 77, actually moved to California, to Los Angeles. Uh, got a job on Routes 2 as a PA. The location manager's back went out on him. They said, he's at home on the floor. Call him every morning, he'll tell you what to do. I did that, and they got me in the union. Became the first African-American location manager in the union at that point, in 70, 78. Um, so, and then uh, did a lot of television, A-Team, Knight Rider, Fall Guy, Cagney and Lacey, Here's Boomer, Matthew Starr. Uh, and while I was doing the A-Team, I got this call from Steven Spielberg's office. I said, yeah, right, and hung up. And they actually called back, and it was to do Color Purple, so that was my first feature. Uh, I've done um, Shawshank Redemption, Mars Attacks, um, uh, a bunch of stuff. And uh, so, that's me. I don't think I can top that. Shawshank. <laughs> For me, Shawshank. Um, my name is Robert Folks. Um, I've been doing this uh, since, well, Terminator 2 was the first feature I worked on, thrown onto that movie, seven months. Uh, didn't scout on it, but suddenly thrust into the shooting of that. And I was just on the shooting, not the scouting, and I was on it for seven months. So that was quite an experience. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, my background, um, I was a child actor. I didn't know I was doing this bio, but it's kind of interesting, I guess. I was a child actor. You can go on YouTube and see me kiss. Uh, uh, Suzanne Plachette kisses me on the cheek on the Bob Newhart show. You can see that on YouTube. <laughs> if you want, that's the one thing that survived on YouTube uh, for a moment. Um, but uh, my dad was an assistant director in 70s television, Kojaks and all that, and my stepdad was uh, account vice president of accounting at Aaron Spelling, so I kind of grew up in the business and the mailroom and all of that. I uh, knew I was going to be in the business. I didn't know what uh, started at a lo uh, fell into locations, working at a location service in Santa Barbara, and realized I love that side of it. I like the creative side of it, um, that we're kind of the first ones hired and we're out scouting and being creative with the production designers and the directors, and that's kind of the first half of our job. And then uh, if you want to also manage and not just scout, then you have to figure out where to park the toilets and all of that. But, um, but no, I, I, still, I still love it. Um, been doing it since Terminator 2, and I did one other TV thing before that, but really that was quite an education starting on that film, and I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, obviously from what I said in my background, so La La Land was very special to me, so. Hi, um, my name is Shawnee Arona, and I was raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, oh, wow, I can't believe it, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, and I, uh, Got my degree in fine arts, actually, originally architecture and then fine arts at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Little did I know that I would go on to do this, but the architecture background has certainly helped. Um, and I ended up moving from Chicago to New York City, then New York City to London, and it was in London that I started my film career, and I was doing a lot of independent producing. Uh, and then I decided to move back to New Mexico because they have a great film incentive program and my parents were there and aging so I thought that's the smart thing to do and it's allowed me to continue to work in film and I kind of got thrown into locations as often that happens with a lot of us kind of in a, in a similar way um, you get pulled in because somebody can't do something and you say, yeah, I'll give this a shot. So that was 13 years ago, um, and now it's what I do full time. And um, I just finished doing the 
uh, sequel to Sicario. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. saw that film. Soldado, so we just finished doing that. And I work primarily full-time in New Mexico because of our incentive program. And, um, but we make it look like anything from Las Vegas, Nevada, to Afghanistan, to Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we can make it look like a lot of different places, so. My name is Laura Sodi Madison. I was born in Hawaii. Um, I started my career in this film industry in Hawaii on the original 5 Of course, I was only 13 then, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had a job as a stand-in, um, and I also played McGarrett's secretary in the last three seasons. And when that folded, I decided I wanted to see what Hollywood was all about, so I moved to California, and eventually, through, I became a production coordinator, but eventually became a location manager, which I found to be fascinating because I was a perpetual tourist. Everything was amazing and interesting to me. And um, I've just been very, very lucky. I've gone from one show to another. Primarily, I do features. Um, some of my shows, um, I just came back two days ago from doing the last Jurassic World. Many of my shows, Linda. Many of my shows ended up in Hawaii, which is thrilling to me to be able to bring back a show to Hawaii, my home state, like I did um, Jurassic Park 3 and Battleship and Jurassic World 1 um, and Jumanji, which is going to be really funny. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you. My name is Tommy Woodard. I... Um, I've been in the industry, I suppose, since 1999, when I was an intern at the Utah Film Commission. So I was raised in Salt Lake City. No, I'm not Mormon. No, I don't have many wives. <laughs> I always get asked that. Um, recently, I've been working on a first season of Snowfall for FX, which is really cool. I just did Transparent. You can see all my credits on IMDb. And recently, well, I guess currently, I'm working on Westworld Season 2. Holy crap. It's cool. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Still is working on season one, but yeah, season two is going to be amazing. Um, and I've got to say, it's freaking cool to be on a panel at Comic-Con. I've been a nerd for so long. <laughs> How cool is this? So, Tommy, why don't you start by telling us what happens in season two of Westworld? <laughs> <laughs> so... Actually, but we will start with you, Tommy. Um, can you tell everybody a little bit about what location scouts do and how the job switches from the location scouting portion to location management and all the things that we handle? I can't answer that, actually. <laughs> so basically, we're one of the first uh, people on a job, on a show, on a film. We work with the production manager, or not the production manager, the uh, production designer, or the director, and we get the screenplay. We break it down through locations, and then we'll go out, we'll go scouting. That's the fun, creative aspect of our job, is going out to go do some scouting. Um, come up with a handful of options for each location that they're looking for, and then they'll thumb through the photos. It's like, oh, let's go check this one out in person. Like, all right. So we'll take them out, they'll check it out in person. They like it, okay, cool. We'll figure out the logistics. That's not the fun part. Like Robert said, parking, finding places to park the restroom. Some people don't like it in front of their house, so we give them some cash. Um, but that's usually the place we gotta put it. The closer the better. Uh, but then we work with, um, we, act, we work with different uh, uh, permitting companies to get all the permits all sussed out. And then we gotta get, like say if we're at a house, we gotta get permission from all the neighbors, uh, get signatures. Um, then work out location agreements with the location we're going to be shooting at, and then get all the insurance, and bleh, it's just so much logistical stuff. Um, so I like, I dream of scouting. That's so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's a constant balancing act back and forth between the creative and the logistical, because yeah. the director might love a place that's difficult to film, or he might hate a place that's really easy, and we wish that he would have chosen. So. Um, it's something that we have to do every day. We got to negotiate between the production company and to keep them happy, and also the general public to keep them happy because we want to be able to come back and film there again. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we'll go to Robert. Uh, Robert, I, I location scouted for you on La La Land, but yes. really all those amazing locations from LA were the work of yourself and Steve Beimler and Tristan Dowsis. Yep. 
please tell us a little bit about those locations and also uh, what it's like now that this movie has become so well received. Uh, well, it's been great. Well, first, La La Land's not really a comic book movie, obviously. Well, it's loud and colorful, <laughs> I guess, but thanks for having me here uh, representing that movie, and we'll talk about Terminator later, which is fun to reminisce about. Um, but La La Land was, like I said, fantastic to, um, to have been a part of from the very beginning. Um, getting that script, uh, my, my, a good friend of mine who's the production designer who I've worked with on several projects but never quite the whole movie. Finally, we got to work together. David Wasco, fantastic human being. His wife, uh, Sandy, is uh, his set decorator. They have quite a, uh, quite a collection of films they've worked on and finally won their deserved Oscar, which was exciting for me. I mean, he did, he did the first three Wes Anderson movies, everything by Quentin Tarantino up through Inglorious Bastards. I mean, quite a career, fantastic designer. And, um, you know, we had a good feeling about this movie while we were doing it, that it was something special. Um, it was an interesting script to read because you'd get to the, uh, the parts with the music and it would just kind of say, uh, you know, Ryan will sing, it'll be, you know, he'll twirl around and then cut to the next, and you're like, whoa, that's obviously gonna be three minutes of the movie, but it's just, so the key, a lot of the key scenes in the movie aren't described in detail like you would maybe in, a, in, in other scenes in a script. So um, there was a lot of creativity given to us by Damien. There were certain things in the script that he definitely wanted. Um, I'm assuming everyone here probably saw it by now. Um, the lighthouse was in the script. We definitely want to shoot the lighthouse. That was the very first thing David and Sandy got excited about showing me. They, the minute they got the script, they're huge jazz fans. So they went down to the lighthouse, went and scouted it, showed me photos um, of that. So we knew we were going to be at the lighthouse. We knew Mia would work on a studio lot. We knew we were going to be at the observatory. The Rebel Without a Cause homage was in the script. But what was fun about it was the creativity of just trying to come up with as many LA things we could visually. Um, obviously part of the big love montage. We shot four or five more things that weren't in that uh, summer love montage, but um, but that that was a fun sequence to do. The very last thing we shot too, just one after the other. Um, but uh, but yeah, to have it turn out as uh, as well received as it did, we had a feeling it might. But um, it was a risky movie in a lot of ways because a musical that's not based on something that's proven. Um, uh, I can tell you one thing, that, well, we, we, we scouted the movie and it kind of shut down and we came back and scouted and shut down. It was because of the cast. It's, it's public knowledge, but we kind of kept it to ourselves for a while. But it was going to be Miles Teller and Emma Watson in the movie. And uh, it kind of, the movie didn't go for a while, then it came back. And uh, Ryan and Emma's chemistry were, was so much better, in my opinion, than Miles and Emma Watson would have been in that movie. Um, and it really came together. Sorry, I'm dissing Miles Teller at Comic-Con right now. Is he here, like, doing Fantastic 412 or something? I don't know. Sorry, and, Miles. And the no. movie was embraced by the city of L.A., wasn't it? Oh, my With God. The, the mayor and La La Land Day. Completely. And... They had a La La Land Day uh, um, when the DVD got released, and uh, they had dancers. You can see that on YouTube, I would assume. They had, uh, they, they had dancers dancing on the side of City Hall. Um, from ropes, and you look up, and it was just incredible just to do that for a DVD release on a movie. That was fa fabulous. I'm sure it's on, on YouTube. And but, that's something else that ties into the, the work we do, because the locations that we scout end up becoming iconic, and they become tourist destinations. Yeah. So a lot of movies have um, filmed at places that now have received a ton more business later. Um, like That's like, been rewarding for me, uh, having... having Having places, I mean, the Smokehouse obviously has had a lot of filming, but just different different places, the Observatory and and the mural on Wilcox, the now the Hollywood stars that everybody stops and takes photos of now. Um, you know, I've driven by that forever, and now um, to be able to, to to put Mia in front of that and put it in a movie and have it be iconic. Um, the lighthouse they decided uh, down in Hermosa Beach. Um, that's an interesting thing in our in our business. A lot of times we're having to scout things that we think we're going to shoot somewhere else, but a schedule might make it want to be somewhere else because the days they need to fill out a day, and oh, let's put these scene. And that happened with this, this Ryan's um, City of Stars scene. You know, it got boarded as being near the lighthouse, or, or not, it wasn't, in the movie it wasn't supposed to be near the lighthouse in the script, but it got boarded on that day. One of, we wanted a day and a half at the lighthouse, and there's the other half of the day. Oh, let's put City of Stars there. 
It was, uh, we, got, we said, okay, fine, we'll figure out where to do it. We started walking around storefronts around the Hermosa Beach Pier, and Damien kind of thought, this is kind of interesting. He'll walk by these storefronts, and we'll kind of light it up, and it'll be at magic hour, like every scene in the movie wanted to be at magic hour, too. That's a whole other thing, is you're, yeah. you're, you're having to, oh, don't get me started on the duet dance, shooting that, uh, literally rehearsing all day, and you have a 10-minute window to shoot the actual one take of the duet dance in Mount Hollywood. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the uh, Hermosa Beach Pier, so we, uh, but we, we, we all stood there together looking, and we suddenly looked down at the pier. <laughs> like, we wouldn't have thought of the pier, and I kept thinking in the back of my mind, let's get a water element in this movie too. This is LA, and Damien didn't necessarily have a specific idea of what water element he wanted, but it is about iconic movie about Los Angeles, so we looked at the pier, and that became one of the key the key scenes in the trailer that got people in the, in the theaters of, of Ryan doing that song on the pier. Um, it was fantastic. That's something that's rewarding creatively when you're scouting something that you, you that came out of that was not in the script. And, All right, thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm Rams. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> um, while La La Land was a near miss at winning an Oscar for Best Picture, uh, Kokai here has actually worked on oh, a Best yeah. Picture winner, which was Million Dollar Baby. And in fact, he's actually done a lot of movies with Clint Eastwood. So uh, please talk a little bit about uh, working with him and um, what, the, what those movies were and uh, maybe an interesting anecdote from uh, the location scouting process on those films. Let me see here. It says, please be aware that members of the audience are under 18. So I don't think <laughs> there's certain things I can disclose, but no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> Uh, working with Clint Eastwood is great. Uh, in terms of a filmmaker, we don't discuss politics, so that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, and, but we, when, you, when you're talking about working with a true filmmaker, you couldn't work with anyone better. Uh, in terms of, and he's, I call him a minimalist, meaning there's not a lot of visual effects. There are, there are in some of the movies, but it's basically he knows what he wants. Scouting with him on the seven or eight films that I did with him, he didn't scout that much. He really relied on his production designer, uh, who was Henry Bumstead for most of those, and now there's a Jim Mirakami, I think, who's working with him now. Uh, the couple of locations that we did scout was for Million Dollar Baby. Uh, we had the battle scene in, uh, that was supposedly Iwo Jima, so we scouted beaches by helicopter in, in Hawaii. Uh, we wound up filming it in uh, Iceland. Uh, on black sand beaches because he wanted black sand beaches as uh, Iwo Jima was. And we wound up filming it, and I can tell you a story about that, but I won't, to, but uh, uh, let me see. I was in Hawaii, scouting the beaches, and I was with the film commissioner at this gas station, and the gas station guy knew she was the film commissioner, he said, so he says to me, so what are you looking for? I guess because I'm, you know, like location manager number 900, who's been there. And I said, well, I'm looking for black sand beaches for, for a war scene in Iwo Jima. He said, oh, like in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> so after we scouted, I got on the internet back in my hotel room. And, and the thing, the problem was, uh, Hawaii was very accommodating, but they really didn't want us because we had to bring tanks, gunfire, and all that on these pristine Hawaiian beaches. Uh, which, and then they have nesting turtles, and, and that's something that you have to be aware of as a location person, what's going on in the environment. I ran into that on Shawshank. The beach at the end of Shawshank was a nesting turtle beach. Oh, right. And I actually went out with them, in Saint, it's on St. Croix, and I actually went out with them, and they, you know, making sure that the turtles, so that was really an interesting, to be out there at night, seeing the turtles come out and actually go into the sea. But, these are the things that we have to do is be aware of the environment. So, uh, and then the pain about not winning the, the, the Academy. <laughs> you know, I had that on Shawshank and had that on Color Purple as well. So oh, finally yes. we did do it. And Million Dollar Baby won it. Probably was the easiest film I've ever <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you, Kai. Uh, Shawnee, so on both Whiskey Tango Foxtrot and the Wolverine movie, Logan, you filmed on American Indian tribal land. Uh, what kind of process and challenges does that mean for you in terms of uh, location scouting and filming there? So I think one of the interesting things that we always face in locations is um, 
Uh, often a location can have five, six different entities that are either in ownership or control, maybe three federal, two state, one private. So we're doing a constant dance with how do you negotiate um, you know, this incredible group of you know, two to three hundred people coming with tons of equipment um, and making this work so that everybody's happy. Um, New Mexico's really beautiful landscape, um, most of it is not private. It's either federally or state owned, or it is Native American tribal land. Um, and I, I've done so many movies that um, you know, we're, we're shooting in these circumstances. So it means that there's a lot of um, attention to cultural sensitivities. Um, and in the case of Logan, um, uh, what was interesting about that is, um, did anybody see that movie? Here, <laughs> so um, we called it Eden. It was the kind of the end of the movie, you know, where the kids are all supposed to be waiting, etc. So we called that Eden, and um, that proved to be an extraordinarily complex um, location for us because, um, again, it was land that was controlled by three different entities: um, one federal one state and then a religious organization, um, actually a Sufi community. And it's up in Abiquiu, New Mexico. I don't know if anybody has heard of Georgia O'Keeffe, but that's where she's you know, famous for painting. So this is up in Abiquiu, New Mexico. It's shockingly beautiful. And those white cliffs are very particular in the area. And the Sufi community there um, has to have pretty much, you know, script approval. And so we approached them and um, they, it was too violent, understandably, um, but there was some land just behind that was their kind of less important land. And it looked just like the land that we wanted. It's called Plaza Blanca. And so they ended up saying, yeah, you can film on this part of it. Um, but then it meant we also had to deal with Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Forestry and um, the state land office. So suddenly it became a much more uh, complex thing. But often when you are filming on um, religious or sacred tribal land, which we certainly did on um, Sicario as well, um, <clears throat> you are um, working directly with, more than anything, it's the spiritual needs of the community. And so we're given quite an extensive list of um, what is okay, and particularly among the Pueblo uh, nations, um, they are very specific about what you can and cannot photograph. Um, uh, you cannot pho photograph any of their symmetries, the churches, um, kivas, so, and that even means crew. So one of the things that we often have to worry about is we can negotiate these incredibly complex deals and we think great this is fine but then we know we have to worry about crew <laughs> and is crew on the day going to be culturally sensitive and appropriate um, and so for us that means that we're kind of doggedly watching everybody because you you cannot even point your cell phone towards the church um, and on Sicario we were um, who how many people here saw that actually Okay, so the, the whole sequence that looks like the Mexican village, that is, um, that's on Laguna Pueblo. And they happen to be quite film friendly, but there are a lot of things that you do have to, to look out for. Um, and um, it, it was a daily practice of having a huge locations team for everybody to be watching crew and where they're pointing their cameras. And the second anything would go wrong, we'd hear from the tribal representative. And, you know, there's always the threat of shutting down um, when that happens. Um, and so it's, it's really an interesting balancing act of, you know, they're excited for the opportunity and um, often for the money. But at the same time, that, that pales in comparison to obviously, you know, they want the integrity of their land and their culture um, respected. And so uh, it can be, a, a daily stressful experience just making sure that crew follows with all of that and they've read the, the, the memo that we've sent out. Um, but it's, um, it's also an extraordinary privilege because often we become part of the community and um, then everybody is invited to the sacred dances and, and it can be just an extraordinary experience. Thank you, Shani. So, uh... <laughs> so Laura, uh, between one Jumanji movie, 
two Pirates of the Caribbean movies and three Jurassic Park movies. You've done a lot of filming and a lot of jungles and other unique environments. What are the risks and challenges with the different natural places you've scouted? And what do you need to do later to protect the crew when they eventually arrive? Well, jungles are very tricky because there's a lot of trees. <laughs> and you, and have, you have the ability to hide many things like snakes and alligators. And every jungle that I've scouted, it's different according to state or country. But um, I guess the, this is why I like shooting jungles in Hawaii, because there's no snakes, there's no <laughs> alligators, there's no chiggers that fall from the trees, uh, and no, no, no deer ticks. So when we shoot in the jungles of Hawaii, um, the biggest challenge is fighting the mosquitoes, which I have found a natural product made mostly out of garlic, and everybody thinks that the Italian restaurant has come to town, and, <laughs> and it really protects you from the mosquitoes. It sounds delicious. <laughs> All right, Kokai, uh, you have the distinction of being the second location professional to be admitted into the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And I don't mean that was all... Yeah. <laughs> that, that actually did not happen a long time ago, as you might expect. This actually happened just a year ago. Um, so why is that the case uh, that so far only two, actually now three, location managers are in the Motion Picture Academy. And do you see the tide changing for other location scouts and managers to be similarly recognized in the future? Uh, yes, and yes. Um, I think primarily is that this job is becoming more respected than it had been. Uh, prior to this, uh, art directors and assistant directors did this job. Uh, and then location managing became a job within itself. It's, it, it sits in a unique place because at the beginning you work more with the art department in finding the look of the picture and finding the locations. But then you switch more into a production side when you get to permits, the budgeting and, and, and those sort of things and the management of the locations. Uh, I must say that the LMGI as an organization fought for the recognition of uh, recognition of location managers and getting a distinction in terms of on the credit uh, in the uh, in the academy as the uh, location management, uh, we are within the art department or art uh, art guild uh, in terms of it within that category. But now that we have location managers recognized, it's it's been a wonderful thing. Uh, nothing happens without a struggle. You know this in life. You know this in everything else. So with the LMGI pushing for it and, and saying that we deserve that, it's understood. The job is, you know, it's not just taking pretty pictures, you know. The job is, after the pictures are taken, it's the management, you know. The management part really, though, is the part I like best. Um, oh. So that's, you know, I mean, uh, I, I love finding the location. I love for it. I mean, I think one or two times I've had a director say, this is exactly how I wrote it or I envisioned it, and that's really great. You know, but how to make it work for me is the puzzle is, is, you know, because sometimes when you read the script, you're saying, how am I going to pull this off? How am I going to pull this off? And then at the end, it's like, oh, that wasn't so bad, you know, and, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of work. And you are between the company and the public, the company and the uh, officials. I mean, I'm talking about state, federal, whatever it is in terms of getting the permits, but sometimes you're between yourself, the public, and the company, getting them to understand as you talk about the sensitivities. Uh, I just, I've been producing the last year, and I just uh, co-produced a film of 1820s Greece in New Mexico, and we built Greek towns and stuff like that, and we filmed on Pueblos, and we filmed, and just, you know, you can shoot this mountain, but you can't shoot that mountain, and so the sensitivities that we have to make the company understand uh, and then the way that we know, we're filmmakers, you know, and that's the whole thing. We're filmmakers. We read the script and we get a vision. And eventually we get the vision of the designer and the director and get it all into one vision. And that's with everybody in every department. And we make it work. So I, more location managers will become a part of the academy. And, um, and it'll just be a gradual process as it is in anything that brings about change. Yeah, this recognition has been coming for a while. Um, 
I think the location manager title first came about maybe in the late 60s or early 70s, uh, while you know there have been cameramen for 140 years. So um, you know we're relatively newer. Uh, we got into the Teamsters Union. Uh, sometimes the DGA covers us on the other coast, yeah. and also the LMGI itself was founded in 2003. So, so also fairly recent. But uh, we've been making a lot of strides with showing the crew what we do, because a lot of what we do, um, the crew doesn't even see. You know, uh, the whole scouting process is before most of those people get hired, and then they show up on the day, and everything's all set with the parking lots and other arrangements, and nobody really thinks like, how, how did all of this happen? So, that's part of the uh, reason that the guild exists and why we do events like Comic Con. So, Robert, um, as we mentioned, one of your earliest movies was Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And you've also done a lot of other big movies and big TV shows. Uh, please tell us about your experience on that classic movie and also, in general, what is necessary to keep in mind while location scouting these kind of uh, big action projects. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't do a lot of action films, um, but uh, there have been a few. I, I, um, I've enjoyed Martin McDonough. I've done two of his films, and there's some shootout scenes in those movies, uh, and, and, a, and a car crash and stuff. But, uh, but um, yeah, I, uh, well, actually, you know what? You, you got me reminiscing about my T2 days, and uh, I can't believe... This is kind of the only thing I kept was my wrap <laughs> T-shirt. Wow! That is awesome. In my storage locker, T2, and then it says Terminator. Two. He'll be back. <laughs> awesome. 1990 Carol Co. Wow. And uh, out of all the location folders, because you're talking about action scenes, the one location. Well, I was only the assistant. I was the measly assistant on that movie. Steve Dawson, uh, Jim Morris, yeah. uh, Richard Klatz were the. Um, were the managers on it. I have no idea why this one full, well I did work on the big Terminal Island freeway shoot, which ties into your action question, placing uh, police officers up and down this entire stretch of freeway, kind of similar to what I had to do in La La Land, but that wasn't a whole stretch of freeway with, with, with literally five different off-ramps on the Terminal Island freeway from the beginning to the end. So placing all of those officers never leaving for the entire evening over the course of two weeks to shoot the final chase with the copter. I, I, I will always remember crouching quickly around the side of the, when the helicopter went under the freeway, which was kind of an unheard of stunt at the time. I even read, because I'd forgotten that James Cameron ended up shooting it himself, because they even, the, the stunt, uh, the photographer thought it was too dangerous. There's some, there's some trivia with that. But I, but I was standing off to the side. You can't see me in the shot, fortunately. Uh, but I'm standing there as that helicopter goes underneath that freeway. But this is kind of interesting how we used to have to put folders together. Now it's all digital. But I, I found this one tracing the entire part of the Terminal Island Freeway from the point where the helicopter starts chasing the police truck and then it crashes into the, everyone's seen Terminator 2, it crashes into the police truck, then they jump into a gardening truck and he jumps into a big rig. But this one little spot so that says, uh, crashes through fence here. That's before they then, and then it cuts to, where did they shoot the, uh, was it in Fontana, the steel mill, I think? That, this is the freeway part of it, but that's also a part of what we do. Um, I worked on um, True Lies after this, uh, not as long, I was on this for a month and a half or something, helping with some of the locations, the Hanson Dam, where they're holding... Uh, holding Bill Paxton by his, uh, over the Hanson Dam. And I was there when they put the horse in the elevator at, uh, at uh, the uh, uh, Bonaventure. Actually, well, that's why I was saying that. They, that sequence, from the time that he steals the horse, if I remember, steals the horse uh, till the horse jumps off the roof, we were calculating how that was shot in three different states, five different cities. You know, it's, it's like, it looks like this sequence where you're doing it, and they just shot that all over and pieced it together, and I was just in the one part where they were putting the horse in the elevator. I mean, that's a big part of what we do is, <laughs> The magic of shooting all these different places and piecing it together, it was, it was, it, it's mind-blowing, uh, the number of locations for a five-minute chase scene. So um, we have about three more questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. And we'll try to move through the next three questions a little more quickly so that we can get a lot of new questions in from you guys. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle for asking when you guys want to do so. Um, but the next question is for Shawnee. Um, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, you did a lot of filming with the U.S. military. 
Uh, please tell us about the Department of Defense approvals and how the process works for using their equipment and their personnel, their, their land bases and all that. It, it really amazed me, actually, um, and I think probably all of us have worked with military in some capacity. It amazes me how they really do try to stretch for you. Um, and what they get out of it is they're giving us their assets. So in Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, everything was real. I mean, we were shooting that at um, Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, which is a nuclear uh, Air Force Base. So the security is as high as you can get. Um, and. What they get out of it is, it's basically, um, they're trying to pull people into the military. Um, and so that's, the, they're recruiting, yeah. And so they, they tend to help us out for movies that go boom, because they know that we all love explosive movies. And, and um, so they really do try to work with us. They do have a certain amount of um, script control. If something, if there's something in terms of um, procedure that, is in the script, they have to, it has to match with what they would do in real life. Um, and on Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, um, we got all those fantastic helicopters. And um, it, it, it's a complex process, but they do try to work with us. It's, that one was many, many weeks of negotiating. Um, but, but I think the biggest thing for us was the security issue, because it is a nuclear base, um, you have to jump through hoops. And so, you know, we were constantly having issues with we'd be able to get crew, we had to go through two different securities, and we would get crew on through one gate, and then the second list of the second gate would not have on. And there was one day that um, there were 12 people, including one of the main actors that day, that I could not, and I was the one coordinating this, for love nor money could I get that actor on set that day. And um, the, the commanding officer was spitting, screaming in my face why this thing had not happened. It was out of my control. It was a production and their clearance office problem, but I was coordinating on the day. And so the only way that they agreed was they had a lieutenant colonel, um, and we were all put into quarantine for 12 hours, and I you know, took it on my own um, responsibility that these people were, were going to be OK. And, um, we had to wait until they cleared because everybody has to have an FBI background check. Every single person down to an, an extra. So it's logistically very, very intense. But you know, we waited for four hours until I got this actor cleared. But it meant that I had to stay with them full time, and I had the, this lieutenant colonel who was not happy um, stay with us the entire time so that wow. I could get them to do the scene. And so that sort of thing does happen. But they really do try to work with us. It's just logistically quite complex in terms of security. Thank you, Shani. Um, Laura. <laughs> so Laura, there's a very surprising fact about that hero oil rig in Deepwater Horizon that many viewers had no idea about. Tell us what that sort of thing is, why it was, and what you did to pull it off successfully. Well, Deepwater Horizon is a, is a um, for me, it was heart, because um, it's a true story. And, and it, it occurred in Louisiana. So when we started scouting for oil rigs, to just to do research, just to get on it for a scout, pretty much everybody shut us down, because they didn't want to have any repercussions from BP. So nobody would help us. We couldn't even scout the California oil rigs. So we ended up actually scouting an oil rig in Mexico uh, just to get the director on so that they can see how a real oil rig will work. But we ended up building that whole rig in the parking lot at a closed, abandonment, a, a closed amusement park, Six Flags, in New Orleans. So it was the director wanted to build the whole oil rig which um, the studio said no, so they built it <laughs> approximately. And that takes years to build, and we only had like six months. And so um, they built 85% uh, scale, uh, and we only built the 72 feet up in the air. Um, and we had a, 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 a dam that we erected of 250 by 300 feet of water that went around this oil rig. Our biggest challenge was how do we get the crew up to the oil rig? How do we light it at 72 feet up in the air? You know, condors are, they were, it was hard. My husband's a key grip, he knows how that works. <laughs> so we brought in two industrial elevators to get the crew up, plus we had stairwells for the hardy to walk up. 
But ironically, my biggest challenge, you know, this industry is not that glamorous, but our biggest challenge was how to get a porta potty up to the top of this <laughs> room. <laughs> And how to get it serviced. I sense a theme of Porter Johns. <laughs> Porter Johns and dumpsters. But they haunt I, us. <laughs> I had a great vendor who came up with a wonderful bathroom gravity system. So just, <laughs> okay. I don't want to Those are the things we deal with. But, um, and I believe that my visual effects team should have won an Academy Award for what they did. Yeah. When we did the explosions, we shut down five freeways wow. to do the explosions on that. But they enhanced it with so many other um, visual effects. It was amazing. They did an amazing job. Great. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Tommy and I both happened to have started our careers uh, working uh, with a film commission prior to becoming a location scout. I worked at the Oakland Film Commission, and Tommy worked at Utah. So uh, Tommy, just tell us really quickly about that experience, and um, if, if you Tell like what it is that a film commission does and how it can help filmmakers around the country and maybe if it's a worthwhile job for other people looking to get started. Film commissions are freaking awesome. They totally help us out when we're first kind of getting started searching for a location because they're basically a state-run organization or a, a territory, uh, but it's a governmental position for the most part. And these guys know their land better than any of us. So we'll give them a call looking for a specific location. They'll hook us up with many different files um, and a lot of contacts as well. If we need a contact for like a Native American um, land, for like Forrest Gump, for example, we would get calls to go to Monument Valley in that area. And so we would hook up different people with uh, that contact so they could suss all their stuff out. I totally spilled my water and it's like dripping Ooh. everywhere. <laughs> I'm gonna get electrocuted. Electric cool place to die though, Comic-Con. <laughs> um, but uh, no, film commissions are great. I worked at one for 10 years. Um, I ended up starting out as an intern when I was 17, just right out of high school because I knew I wanted to get my foot in the door in the film industry somehow. So I had somebody come from the Utah Film Commission to my drama class. Oh, look, thanks. Um, somebody came from uh, the film commission in Utah to my drama class told us exactly what they did and I'm like, I'm hooked. I got to go try to get an internship over there. So I eventually got one and I ended up staying there for 10 years um, being their location scout for, uh, for most of that, most of that time and a photo librarian. But basically to start out, definitely give a film commission a call because they can hook you up with, you know, different filmmakers or uh, films coming to town, they can get you on like starting as a production assistant or at least get you the contacts so you can you know, work your magic and get that job yourself. It's really cool. Film commissions are great. <laughs> All right. We'd love to hear some questions from you guys. Yes. Hi. So I'm starting to do location work for some things I'm shooting and I've run into two obstacles. How do you deal with retailers when you'd really like to get into a store to have a good store feel for the shot? And also, another thing I have is a public environment where I need to have people parading around with guns, and I don't want to cause the whole city to shut down. So what... Uh, what city are you in? In a very small town, so literally if I have five guys showing up with uh, pretend automatic weapons, I swear, uh, it's not going to come out really well. <laughs> Well, it's something that we do deal with quite yeah. a bit. Um, yeah. We, you know, we have long process with uh, the film permit to and notifications to let people know ahead of time and um, you know, special sec security and safety features on set. Do you guys want to jump in with some of it? I'll just say yeah. I'll, I'll go with the store thing. Um, if you find a store that you like, uh, first of all, you got to find out is it a chain? You know, is, can you clear the name of the store? Those, I mean, those will be our department, but they'll also be your, your worry as well. And then you have to consider uh, how much time are you going to take up at the store? Are they going to lose any business, any revenue? And, you know, how you affect them? And are you going to be able to compensate them? Or is it something they're going to get out of it by having their store featured in your, in your film? and just have to take in, if you're in a commercial area, how you're going to affect the businesses around them. And there is a flip side to that. He's talking about stores that we're featuring, but oftentimes we're just filming on the street and there's a store that happens to be in the background and, you know, 
uh, there's the whole issue of like, are we impacting them and do they need compensation from us or not? You know, are they part of the landscape, you know, or, you know, that there's a whole legal thing that uh, precedent on that. So that's another thing that we have to consider. Um, yeah. I was, well, I was to say, if, you, if you're filming uh, in, in a store, a small store, the small film, you could entice them to by putting them in the scene. Sometimes that helps by letting them be the person that's the clerk or the bartender, and then now they're a little more excited about doing it for, for free and letting you use their place for free, if they're a good actor. You know what? Grab one of us after as well, and we can, oh, yeah, we can go definitely. a little bit more into detail. Yeah, with, the, yeah, sure. with, with talking to the Thanks, police honey. and all that. Yeah. As far as the gun thing, though, yeah. Uh, you've got to coordinate with the police department. Yeah. Have a meeting. <laughs> and, yeah, have a big meeting and do the notification of when you're going to be there, what's happening. No and, surprises and, on yeah, that. Yeah, no surprises on something like that. Yes, sir. Hi there. I, I actually recognize most of you on here. I started in business as a security guard in 98, and I'm actually trying to get back in. My question to you is, uh, what important key factors do you look in the hiring process of your team, such as assistant location managers? Well, um, well, I personally um, like people that are very organized and, you know, with their uh, database of contacts and um, they are high tech enough that they're constantly, you know, able to text me back and, you know, provide updates that way. Um, I mean, experience is always great. The more location experience they have, the better. But, I mean, I would often rather have somebody who's just starting out if that person's really eager, too. So, you know, somebody's very motivated and wants to work hard and, uh, you know, do a good job on the film set. But you also need to be flexible and handle the ability to handle stress, I think, is really important. And great with people. A, yeah. real, <laughs> a real conflict resolution person. But grab us as well after, and we can yeah. give you more pointers. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I recently returned from living abroad in Malta um, as a Fulbright Scholar. And while I was there, the Azir window fell. Uh, it's most famous for being the wedding scene yeah. for Game of Thrones. Um, and while I was there, a lot of the locals, the Maltese, were very upset that the, they believed that the Malta Film Commission and others didn't do enough to protect that natural landscape that's now at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so my question for you is what steps are taken before filming and, and even during filming to protect these natural landscapes and habitats that you film on? Yeah. You've experienced that more. Uh, I, I think, I mean, a lot. If, if, it's, if you've got a good manager and a, and a good production company, we, we do absolutely everything possible. And often we have to bring in engineers, we have to bring in archaeologists, we have to bring in biologists um, uh, to basically sign off and say, you know, no, this structure can't handle it, or yes, it can handle it. So we have to jump through generally a lot of, of hoops to make sure it is, is uh, going to be protected. I mean, I'm sure that you know, there are certain circumstances where, you know, that doesn't happen. But for the most part, everything I've ever worked on, and I'm sure most, most everybody up here, we are hardcore about that. That is, you know, and, and we are known for, we, we, we basically advocate for the community and the location. You know, we try to get the production company what they want, but we advocate for that location, yeah. and you have to do that. It's absolutely critical for our job. Yeah, you so don't want to be the guy that yeah. destroyed something. Absolutely. You'll never yeah. live that down. Because it's only your reputation in this industry, so. Yes. I have a question for Tommy. No, the answer is no, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had like an interesting or weird experience taking pictures and scouting? Too many. Yeah. <laughs> Way too many. Um, <laughs> I guess the biggest weirdest thing that's ever happened to me when I was taking a sh picture was when uh, I was working at the Utah Film Commission. I went up to scout a like a Girl Scout camp somewhere, and on my way down, I'm, it's not calm what down, think. let's keep it PG. Let's keep it PG, guys. Yeah, read, read, read the back of this. Yeah. Um, on my way back down the canyon, it was a very beautiful area, so I was just leaning out of the car, taking pictures, while it was stopped. The car was stopped. Uh, so I got back to my office that day, and I went through all my pictures, it went good, except, it went well, except for the last picture, I had a little speck on the corner. I'm like, what is, what is this nonsense? So I zoom in, it's a freaking UFO, guys. It was a UFO. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a weird, <laughs> weird saucer-looking thing, and I was younger at the time, I think I was like 20 or 21 or something like that. So I did what anybody else would do, is I'd release it to the press. 
<laughs> Without asking permission. I almost damn near got fired, guys. Um, However, just Google Tommy Woodard UFO and you'll... <laughs> it's ridiculous. It, it went national. I mean, CNN did a story on it. it was, <laughs> just Google it. That's a good one. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've talked a lot about working with art directors, but we also work very closely with the visual effects uh, producer and the visual effects supervisor you know, to, to try to figure out you know, creative solutions for some of the things in real life that are more difficult. Yeah. I don't think it's a, I think it intertwines completely. You know, you'll shoot a location that you know that they'll turn into like in Jurassic World, we shot these locations and then you see all these dinosaurs that are in it. But I think they, they're not separate. They're, they're definitely together. We often talk about, we give them the bones, we give the director and the production designer the bones of something um, so that they can build off of it either physically or digitally. So mm -hmm. it, it's very much. I mean, more and more lately, it's, it's nice to be standing at a location and they'll say, oh, we could just take that out digitally. <laughs> And just things, even just seems like a few years ago, five years, you're standing in front of a building and uh, well, I'm on, on a show right now where there's a flagpole right in the shot, it looks horrible, and they're gonna paint it green and they're gonna take it out. And it feels like they would have just said, find another one, you know, a few years ago. Now, it really opens up things when you're standing there mm -hmm. looking, scouting. Yeah, I did a movie that we filmed at the Pantages Theater and we were recreating the, uh, the premiere of a film from the 50s. So uh, the marquee doesn't look anything like it did back then. It's all digital now. So um, it would have been thousands of dollars to uh, switch that out or cover it up. But um, they said, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll just do the sidewalk. Uh, we'll decorate the sidewalk, but then visual effects from everything up to uh, everything up, erase yeah. over that. Um, well, Jim Connor was definitely a crazy one. Uh, we had uh, Ken Block driving 120 miles per hour across the Bay Bridge, and uh, when he did the jump that you saw in the clip, um, he was going 70 up that hill and just skyrocketed over the top and came down on the other side on the downhill. And um, that took six weeks of prep to uh, be able to pull all those kind of things off, to um, deal with all the uh, per permit issues and the police and the neighbors and make it safe because, you know, if that car had veered off you know slightly it could have uh, crashed into a house so it was something that we tried to consider every possibility for uh, how to fix it and make it safe on the day permits are different in every state though every city every, every, city. every city every state um, like in generally like if say you wanted to like film on a beach Uh, well, I would start with the website of the jurisdiction and see if they have anything listed. Um, you know, it's a good place to start. If there's still questions after that, call the California Film Commission and see if they can direct you toward um, a jurisdiction that might not have a website for some reason. And but I think that's, pretty that's much a good every, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think a lot of places will require a permit. But then if you're talking about the size of the production, the bigger you are, you yeah. absolutely have to. But, you know, a lot of indie films, you know, might go without, you know, if it's a crew of five people. Don't and, encourage them. Not encouraging, but <laughs> it happens. And I, I think that might be what she was getting at. Uh. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we, it's our job to figure out, you know, what needs to be done. And, you know, but ultimately, the, the final goal is safety. You have to have a permit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're a student film or not. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because they especially want you to have insurance, and that protects you as a person, as a company as well. Someone trips over a cable, someone does something, you know, you're liable. So they're going to want you to have insurance. With one last question. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, Robert, you mentioned that the pier was kind of an inspired oh, yeah. moment shot. I wanted to know for the rest of the panel, like, what are some uh, kind of inspired moments, shots that made it into film that maybe weren't original that you were involved in? Or, if you don't have one of those, one of the weirdest places that you've dressed up to look like something else. <laughs> uh, 
jeez. Uh, um, well, just it was written. Well, it was written in the story, but the tree in Shawshank was like the most memorable uh, for us, and uh, you know, it was a real search to find that tree, and uh, it worked. The tree is now down; it, it died. Uh, yeah. But uh, and then that prison, of course. Uh, but uh, for me, it was the tree in Shawshank. We I'd, uh, we got to end. Unfortunately, it's two oh, o'clock. Um, we will be out in the hallway to talk to you guys further, and we want to thank you guys for coming here. This is uh, the Location Managers Guild International, and you can also find us on Twitter at, at the underscore LMGI and locationmanagers.org.